Welcome everyone to another episode of the Truth, Love, Freedom podcast. Today I'm with my cousin Kenya. How are you doing today? Hey, I'm doing all right. How are you doing on this fine cold evening? <laughs> another great day. Could you tell me and the viewers a little bit about your family? Explain your dad and your mom's side? Yeah, so on my mom's side, um, they were from Georgia originally. Um, but most of my mom's siblings were born here in New Jersey. But, except for my older uncles, I think I think two uncles were, were in Georgia with my grandma. Um, I don't know, know what year they came up here, though. It was a long time ago. Let me see, my mom was born in, like, the uh, late 50s, early 60s. So, they must have... Yeah, I don't know when they got up here. My dad's side... They're originally from Maryland, um, which is really interesting. I get well, interesting in that um, my mom's like a dark-skinned woman, and my dad is like very light-skinned. He could pass for a white guy until you really look at him. Um, <laughs> so, yeah. Was there any um conflict of ideology between your parents, a split in religion, politics, or anything like that? No, I don't think so. They were both... I would say my mom was more Christian than my dad, but my dad is Christian. Um, ideologies and whatnot, I think... I, I think they just, the only split they really had were just in personalities, because they didn't work out. They, they split when I was two. Oh. Did you live in Violin your whole life growing up? Yep, uh, we, I don't remember living anywhere out other than Vineland. Uh, I remember having family everywhere, like, of course, when you visit family, you're like, yeah, they're in Bridgeton, or they're in Camden, or whatever, but me, myself, no. I'm born and raised in Vineland. How was Vineland growing up? Have you noticed any changes over the years, or still the same place you grew up in? It feels like it's less, mm, like there's less going on. Like, I remember there was always something going on or maybe it's just because now that I'm an adult I don't know <laughs> where anything is like I remember the Puerto Rican festival we went there every year um that was fun the food was delicious the rides were great and then like the car shows which now there's they're bringing back I think like after COVID like things were just kind of rocked a little bit but I wasn't in the country at the time so I didn't realize how much had changed until literally coming back like almost two years ago so yeah would you say that was more of a community when you were younger yeah yeah but i think that's, that's coming back now because i work at the library now so and we, we do host a lot of community events free events and then we see a lot of people who are like wow i'm so happy that this is here because i remember when i was a kid a b and c and i really wanted my kids to experience something like this like to let them know that the community is here like or if at least if you come to the library you're bound to see somebody you know kind of a feeling i feel like we have lost that a little bit it's the violent library correct that's holding these events. yeah yeah what kind of student were you through middle school and high school i was a goody two-shoes kind of a kid <laughs> i was definitely a nerd i loved to read um my first not my first book. I, I was my mom had me reading when I was like two, like picture books. Actually reading them. I don't know how she did it, but um, my first like series that I remember is Harry Potter, and it's just been I, I've just been devouring books ever since. Now I'm more leaning into like graphic novels and comic books, just because of time constraints, and it's just easier to swipe through like six volumes of a manga. Um, than getting through, like, a trilogy right now with life being as busy as it is, but yeah. What influenced you to be a good, such a good student your whole life? Terrified of my mom, you know? <laughs> like, like, she harped all the time that education is important, education will get you opportunities, um, education will make you strong, um, being a black woman just being black and just being a woman in living in the United States people are going to disagree but no there is a history of um just disparity between like the economic like economic disparity social disparity between just 
any ethnic group and black people, especially with black women. Unfortunately, when you look at certain statistics, black women are still coming out in the bottom. But then when you look at other things, like in terms of like, um, higher education, you'll see that black women are quite up there, but still not reaping the same rewards or benefits that count their white counterparts are getting, which is real messed up. But my mom wanted me to at least have that chance that even if it was at the bottom of the barrel, so to speak, I still had a chance to reap even a trickling of the rewards of that. Would you say through your mom you learned at a young age that you had to work twice as hard to get what you needed in life? Absolutely. She would tell me all the time that you're going to have to work twice, three times, even four times as hard just to match what somebody else is doing and you're going to shine brightly when you do it but you're going to get very angry <laughs> when um all you get is a good job but not a pay raise <laughs> or not the award or the reward or at the end of it yeah who would you say were your major influences growing up oh my mom for sure um she for a while was a single mom and she had me and my older brother and then she had my older brother who unfortunately had children very young um she had to help she had to actually raise his those kids for a bit because you know the mom was also quite young at the time so it was four of us for a little bit and she made it work she made sure we never went without even though she would come home tired and not wanting to be bothered, but she was still a mom, and she we still had dinner on the table. We still had that mommy and me time. She would still spend time with us regardless. And then when my stepdad came, it was her and my stepdad. Um, and he had a pretty big influence of me growing up. Um, like, the kind of, like, the kind of partner I would want I, it feels weird just like and, and I, no disrespect to my stepdad because he was a great guy but I could see where he and my mom didn't work but and I could see oh this is not what I would want in a partner if the, especially if there's like a clash that that happened as often as it did with my mom and stepdad um well it's influenced me my dad like I get a lot of my I feel like I get a lot of my personality from my dad like he's very calm really chill but I get a lot of my emotional state from my mom. Um, um, your mom has influenced me a lot. She is a strong lady. Um, so I would say that a lot of women in my life I was heavily influenced by. What career did the younger Kenya want to be when she got older? She wanted to be a vet. She wanted to be a veterinarian. And um, unfortunately, we had, a, we had a dog who was great. His name was Zeus. And he was a Doberman. I love him to pieces. He's great. And we got him as a rescue from a really bad situation. But when it came time where he got he, he got too sick to really get, be brought back, we they left teenage Kenya in charge of deciding what to do. Do we keep trying to bring him back or do we let him go? And I made the choice to let him go. I was there. I felt his last heartbeat, I made sure he saw me, and that broke me. I was like, I can't do that. I, I can't do this. I cannot. <laughs> like, so, shout outs to vets. They are amazing and strong people because that one instance of having to put my dog down, I couldn't do it. So you didn't become a veterinarian, but you did pursue a path to help other people, didn't you? You want to tell the viewers a little bit about the journey you took in your life? Yeah, so, I love animals. People not so much, but people who want knowledge or people who are seeking to better themselves, those are the people that I find myself wanting to help more. Um, so I became a an English teacher um, in Japan, um, became an assistant English teacher, but that <laughs> assistant it was very loose. I became like the main teacher for, for quite a few of the classes. Um, but that, those were mostly for the students that were seeking to learn more than just basic classroom English. Like they had a dream, they had a goal, and it involved either using English as a tool to better themselves, to get better jobs, or to talk to new friends, or 
to go to school overseas. Um, and now I work at the library as a library associate, um, directing people to the knowledge that they're seeking. Like, I may not have the answer, but I sure as heck can tell you where to find it and get you started. <laughs> When you were a teacher over at Japan, do you have any funny or interesting stories? Oh my gosh, I have a lot. Now that I'm on the spot, though. Yeah, it's always hard to think on the spot. Um, yeah, there was one of my little tots. I, I taught elementary, junior high, and every so often high school. I did some seminars or some programs. Um, my elementary schoolers, though, they were hilarious. I had one little girl. She was in second or third grade, and I was on, I was walking to to this elementary school. I was either walking to or walking away. I don't remember. Um, and she stopped, and we're having a conversation. She was just excited to see me, but then she asked me in Japanese, like, "Is Kenya? You have a very tall butt. And I'm like, Why?" And I'm like, "Um, it's because I'm a tall person. I think maybe." And she's like, "No, but." My mom's butt's not tall, and your butt's tall. And I was like, well, I guess it's better that it's tall and not that big, I guess. And then she just proceeded to say, you like, I'm going to call you, like, 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 Takayo Shiri Sensei, which is, like, Tall Butt Sensei. Miss Tall Butt Sensei. I'm just like, please don't. <laughs> I do not want you to get in trouble over this. Like, like this is her rationalization of just, like, yes, this makes sense. I'm going to call you this now. And then, of course, the best, like, I think this is, like, my favorite story, teaching little third graders in our little, little trailer, in our little English room. And we're sitting on the floor, and the trailer, it's like, it's like an aluminum trailer, like, it's a flimsy little thing. And one kid just, just lets, like, the loudest fart out in the middle of a lesson, and it vibrates the floor. And <laughs> this tiny little Japanese kid, he just, like, like, he just seized up, he was like, oh no. And I'm trying not to die, like... I had to turn away. I felt like I was about to wheeze, like, keel over, and all the kids were just bust out laughing, but the teacher, she was so mad. She was like, that's not appropriate. You shouldn't do that in the middle of class. But then you meet the other teachers over there just like, ah, well, I mean, you know better out than in. <laughs> you know? <laughs> Are there any other languages you know besides English and Japanese? Um, I know a little bit of Korean. I'm trying trying to learn Spanish. I don't know what it is about the Romance languages, like Spanish in particular, that is like such a standstill for me. Like I know, I know words, I know some grammar, but putting them together and trying to speak is such a struggle. I don't know why, <laughs> but yeah, give me some Korean any day. I'm like, oh yeah, okay, I get it. Which language was hard, alone in Korean or alone in Japan? Japanese? They're both actually quite similar grammatically. Um, I would say just Korean with the vocab, it's a little tough, but actually not actually not that bad because a lot of the, like they have similar vocab. That's just the Korean pronunciation instead of Japanese pronunciation. So yeah, they're not that bad. I just need to actually actively study Korean because when I was living in Japan I had to use my Japanese but now that I'm like kind of studying Korean a bit more I don't really have a chance to use it. Was it scary for you to move to another country at first? Absolutely it was but I moved to Japan it was both like to fulfill a dream but also to run away like because at the time me and my mom were going through something that I don't think any mother and daughter should ever go through but it happened and I can fully say it wasn't my fault um now I can say that before I was like trying to like figure out why justify we were, what was happening. justify what was going on because I really could not understand because I thought we were okay but we were not and I felt like she was lashing out at me a lot and I didn't understand why until Someone let me know whatever was going on previously before when I was studying abroad in Japan caused a rift between her and I. And I but I didn't know anything about the rift until, again, she was lashing out at me. Um, so I basically went to Japan because uh, I've always wanted to go. Like I've always had an interest in Japanese culture since I was in middle school, um, but I didn't think I'd live there. I thought I'd just travel there and just you know have some fun um but 
it was it was a great experience and I was happy I was happy to get there but first get getting there and realizing that textbook Japanese and real people Japanese are very different <laughs> this is like I know what you said individually I don't know how to turn that into words that I know kind of a situation like that happened a lot but after like coming to terms that like I'm in a foreign country I need to deal with it this is what you want to do so I just threw myself into every situation I could to alleviate that fear which mostly went away but there were still times where a new situation would pop up in Japan that I'd be like kind of scared because I was like what if I say something stupid so I'd be practicing sentences in my head for every scenario that would happen that could possibly happen but it was all right <laughs> When you traveled to Japan, did you do did you do it alone, or did you go with a group of friends or a group I of people? Went with a group of people because so I applied to the Jet program, the Japan um, Exchange and Teaching program. I thought it was a Japan English Teaching program, but that is not what it is. I'm fairly sure it's the Japan <laughs> Exchange Teaching program, um, and it's a really prestigious program. Um, it, it's it's really hard to get into, so I count my stars and I'm very blessed that I even managed to get into an interview let alone get on the program um and you go with so first when you do the interview well you do your application and all that and you get invited to an interview you do have to choose what consulate you want to apply to you can choose like so say we're here on the east coast wherever your Japanese consulate is closest to you which could be here we're in New Jersey we're closer to New York you can do the New York consulate or you can do like the um, Washington DC consulate I or I think you see New York DC San Francisco Chicago yeah I'm trying to think of where all the freaking consulates are so anyway East Coast New York and DC I was told that the New York consulate was really hard to really get into because everybody was going up there or applying to that through that one just to get on the same program and I was told hey the DC program or the DC consulate funny enough is a little bit easier to like get your application into because not as many people um, apply everyone's like so you know stuck on New York because you know it's New York City I really didn't want to deal with that journey so I applied to the DC consulate I got invited to an interview my dad who's kind enough to let me who, he drove me down and we were only down there for the day and again my mind was like not even in Japanese I was just thinking of like what if they ask me questions in Japanese what do I do like and this was actually about a year after I came back from studying abroad in Japan so my Japanese was much better than than when I left like the US for the first time but still um, so you get into the interview, they, they ask me questions of like, where did I study abroad in Japan? Why did I choose the prefecture I wanted to go to? Which at the time was Hokkaido. I still wish I got Hokkaido, which is the northernmost Canadian, Canadian looking prefecture. It's just snow galore in wintertime and be because I love snow. And I think I said that in an interview. They were not convinced that I should go to Hokkaido <laughs> just because I loved snow. I guess. Not better or anything. I guess I'm grateful that I got selected in any way um and then they asked for like a, a dem demonstration on like a teaching demonstration they said that they were the students I was the elementary school teacher because at the time I applied for elementary schoolers and I gave them a little demo lesson on Halloween and I was just as energetic as I could be and this was before I had coffee I never drank coffee my god you get me on coffee I am as energetic as it, yeah it's not great but <laughs> I try but they liked my lesson I got accepted I got invited to go with the DC consulate group to Japan and that's where the journey started my dad had to take me back down to DC to fly out of Dunellen Airport that's the DC Airport and that's where that seven-year journey started <laughs> When you were over at Japan, did you become friends with other native English speakers? Oh yeah, like um, especially with the prefecture that I was in, Yamanashi, we have the Yeti organization, Yamanashi English Teachers International. Um, and you don't have to be an English teacher to be in the organization, you can just 
you could be anybody. You can just be a foreigner who wants to connect with the foreign community. And we are many people strong over there. Um, my best friends are like one girl. She's um, half American, half Bermudian. We lived together for five years before she went back to the U.S. And she b became one of my best friends. And then another girl from the Florida consulate. We lived in the same city as well. She's, oh my gosh, she's great. And then the newer members that came as the years went, there's one girl. Um, we went, we, <laughs> before the, uh, for pandemic times, like literally right before the pandemic set in, we went to Okinawa to spend Christmas and then New Year's in Tokyo and all that. And she's like one of the most special people in my life, but she's still off gallivanting around the world. I'm only slightly jealous and wish I could go with her, but I'm really, I'm, I, I met a lot of really cool people and I'm really humble. I feel humble like by their journey through Japan and just by their lives. And I'm just like, wow, I wish I was that cool. <laughs> Do you still keep in contact with some of those people today? Yeah, I talk to the two girls, the one Floridian and the one Bermudian American girl. We talk like almost every day, if not every other day, just on a group text. And yeah, I still we I still get texts from mostly everybody. And same. I also have like um I, they're my host family and that they fed me and then they couldn't get rid of me. <laughs> um and they took care of me when I was kind of going through some rough times like when I got sick my host mom cooked me like um she cooked me this really nice like just Japanese soup with like meatball dumpling things that was really delicious because I had the flu my very first year like not even my first year it's like literally my first three months in the country and she came over and made me some soup and then I'm like yeah this is my host mom now <laughs> besides your host family did you make any other native Japanese friends along the way yeah I met some of them I met through my foreign friends others I met just through the org like stuff I did like I did um, da um Odaiko which is Japanese drumming um, I made friends through that group and funny enough I w actually I was introduced to the group by my foreign friends and then Japanese archery um, Kudo and it was my two friends that we lived in the same town and lived next door to each other. We w actively wanted to do this activity. So we, one friend found information from one of her teachers where to go to get more information. And then we all went to, we all hopped in, I don't know whose car we hopped into, but we all hopped in the car and we went to the address they gave us. We found the where, which was funny enough, was actually at the president's house. It wasn't even where the dojo was. We just showed up to his house. We're like, hi, we want to learn Kudo. And he's like, oh, okay, well, follow me. We're going to go to the dojo. Good thing it's practice today. <laughs> and then, yeah, we met some really nice people who really took us under their wing to teach us their, more of their culture and more of the sport. Was it easy for you to teach the kids English? Not at first. I really, like, I had tutoring experience. I had babysitting experience. I've like taught like d during ba like my babysitting experience like I've t like taught kids or at least like we reinforce what they already knew coming up with a lesson plan trying to figure out activities and all that was really daunting and of course like you have the foreigner community of fellow English teachers to fall back on and ask them like well how do you do a b and c and but how do you do A, B, and C, I don't want to copy you, but I want to turn it into something different kind of a thing. Um, and then trying to keep to the standards of the country because Japanese, how the Japanese teach their children is a bit, fair bit different than how Americans teach their children. So trying to not forget what I knew as, a, as an American student or what I learned as an American student but trying to figure out how do I incorporate certain aspects of like my American student upbringing into the Japanese student upbringing? How can I mesh the two or when should I learn to yield one to the other kind of a thing? That was really tough. And it took me, it took me a while to figure that out. That didn't take me a year. It took me like a few years to figure that out. 
What would you say was the best part about teaching young kids? Um, I, when, honestly, like, they, in Japan, like, the kids will give you, like, little letters or something if they, if they're a bit too shy to talk to you or if they're getting ready to go off, or they're getting ready to graduate or they're getting ready to move up a grade level or something, they'll give you little letters. Um, and of course some of, like, the, these are kind of obligatory letters, especially in elementary school. So a lot of them are like, oh, thank you for teaching me English or just thank you in general. But the ones that would, that stuck out to me were the really heartfelt written letters that were like, Miss Kenya, I was really bad at English last year, but I'm not really good at it, but it's still really fun. And that really like cemented for me. I'm like, okay, even if I I can't come up with like a great lesson plan that sticks to the kids that's like oh they're gonna learn their ABCs in like 20 minutes it's gonna be great we're gonna get our B verbs down in this one lesson kind of a thing like as long as my lessons were fun and my kids came into my lessons feeling good and actually happy and not groaning like oh you gotta do English class again and Miss Kenya's here as long as like I could at least make them feel good that English wasn't like another boring class and they felt comfortable in my class. I was like, okay, yeah, this will be fine. Thankfully, I did get the skills I needed to teach the lessons and make it interesting, but that 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 really had hit me in the heart. It was really nice to get like letters like that. Speaking of hearts, what is it inside of you that makes you want to help other people? I don't know. I really don't know. I don't know if it's just, I kind of feel like people have innate skills and I've finally come to terms with the fact that I am good at helping people, but I don't know why. I don't know if it comes from my grandma who helped a lot of people. I don't know if it comes from my mom who's helped a lot of people in and out of our family. Um, I learned that my great, great, great-grandfather um was a slave who bought his freedom and he started a church that church burned down three times and he kept rebuilding the church to help people and so i don't know if it's genetic i don't know if it's like just an inherent need in me but it is something that I do see myself doing. In what capacity? I still don't know. I feel like I'm still jumping around, but I'm like, well, as long as somebody gets help while I'm figuring out what I need to do, that, 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 that's fine. You mentioned some of the cultural differences between America and Japanese. Did you notice any other major differences being over there? Toilets are so different. <laughs> I was... I was introduced to the beauty of the bidet. The bidet is wonderful, y'all. Y'all need a bidet in your life. Do not, do not go around being a booty heathen. Just get a bidet. Um, but also, just general bathroom culture is different. Um, like, you know how we're taught from a well over there. They're also taught this from a young age. Like you wash your hands after everything you do. You go to the bathroom, you wash your hands, and. I don't understand. Something between elementary school to adulthood, that gets lost and I get grossed out. <laughs> there were so many times I got grossed out. I'm just like, why are you not washing your hands? You just left this bathroom, woman. I just saw you do this. Or, so, bathroom culture was a bit different. And not to say that all Japanese people don't wash their hands. That's, that's false. It's just don't be surprised if you go out of a bathroom and you somebody didn't wash their hands um food culture was really big um, i came from a food culture where in my family when we had a meal together everybody got their own plate of whatever they wanted over there when you eat as a group it's a bunch of small dishes and everybody picks what they want and you don't eat the last thing on that plate until you ask everybody if they're okay with that and usually nine times out of ten they are, especially if you want it. But if somebody else wants it, then you, you compromise. Like, you compromise and you cut it in half and you so you can both get it. And that took me a while to really get used to. Because I was so used to just having my own. Which, I again, really... That's just really an American food culture thing. Which is... 
for me, that's not healthy. Like I realized how unhealthy that was for me. Um, and why I had issue with like, um, getting used to the way Japanese people or just when you're in a group of Japanese folk that you should share. Food is meant to be shared, not hoarded. And I still kind of like grapple with that, particularly when it comes to sweets. I love sweets. I don't like to share my cookies. I don't like to share my cake. I've hurt, a fe hurt some feelings because of that and it made me feel bad. So I'm still working on that. <laughs> but yeah, food culture, um, hygiene culture. Oh yeah, more on hygiene culture. So like bathing, I was still, I don't want to say I was shocked because I had studied, like I said, I studied abroad in Japan while I was in school for like six months. So I'd been to a hot spring, but like the first time, even but even though, even then, the first time I went to a hot spring, the um, teachers and all like, you know, our, our um, escorts, they were like, well, you're going to have to get naked. You're going to have to wash up before you get into the hot spring. That didn't feel scary to me. It just felt so interesting to see nobody cared that you're naked in this hot spring with like a bunch of strangers versus like in America, as soon as somebody takes a shirt off, they're flipping out. Um, but nobody cared. Of course, you're not taking your clothes off like outside and like in the streets of Tokyo or anything like that. But like if you go to a, if you go to a bathhouse, there is like a, like, um, unspoken there's just unspoken rules where you don't look at somebody directly who's naked because that's just uncomfortable for everybody but you can have conversation with people in the spring if you just just happen to strike something up and you're just both completely naked and you're just having this conversation like having a talk having a nice conversation and i met some of my quick <laughs> some really good friends that way too like once you go into a hot spring together like it's no ball like it's it, you're good <laughs> friends for life you're friends for life pretty much like you've seen each other naked you're like yeah i think we're we're cool now do you think there's any aspects of japanese culture that we're missing here in america um community that like uh, bringing that back definitely community like kids can so from a young age japanese kids um when they start going to school they're they're taught to go to school together there's select routes that kids from a certain age or just a certain grade or just even just in a certain district in a city, they go to school together. Like when the first kid goes, like usually it's the oldest kids first. Like so the sixth graders will come, go to school and they'll go to everybody. They'll meet up at a one spot or they'll go to the, the students that they know whose routes on the house, um, whose houses are on the route they're supposed to go to. Um, and they'll wait for everybody, and once everybody's there at a certain time, they all go to school together. Everybody knows each other, the parents know whose kids are supposed to be in the group, so, like, little Saki-chan can go to little, like, um, Kotaro's mom and ask her for something, and then Kotaro's mom can be like, yeah, I'll give this to you, and then let little Saki-chan's mom know that, hey... I gave your daughter this, I hope that's okay. Like, there was that sense of, like, the, the village. The village was there. Like, always there. Um, school life. I really wish American kids could have, like, a similar school life in Japan in that they're given the opportunity to learn and explore on their own and figure out just social dynamics. Like, yet the teachers were there to guide them and to give advice and discipline if needed but nine times out of ten um, the students and your peers were ex they were expected to take care of each other to guide each other and I don't want to say police each other but like just make sure everybody was doing the best that was up to their potential um, school life School life is what you made of it. If you wanted a crappy school life, then that, you could do that. That's up to you. But if, like, for school festivals and all that, if you wanted an amazing school festival, then if you put your heart and soul into it, then you had an amazing school, fe like, festival. And I really wish we had more of that in the U.S. Leads me to my next question. When you were over at Japan, you always felt like part of a big family. They always took you in well. Not always. Um... There was still that sense of otherness, and yeah, um, 
I'm a very tall foreigner, very tall black foreigner, um, where not, most of the time I can't say that I was ever really excluded, but I was still kind of treated as the other. Like I was still like, I don't want, like babied in a way, even though I learned the language, even though I became certified in the language, even though I did all these amazing things that a regular Japanese person did, I was still treated as, oh well, we don't get you just you know she's all right don't don't you just give her this this is fine kind of a like I was patronized a little bit and I would have days where I'd be like maybe I should just leave like I'm so sick of doing like all of my efforts aren't being looked at or again like my mom was like you you have to work four times as hard but in Japan when you're a foreigner that's that's still there you have to work harder than the average Japanese person in order to just kind of um not be looked at as you don't know what you're doing and I'd been there I just remember this one time I'd been there at that point for six years I'd been at my both of my schools knew all the teachers that came in um and everybody knew my abilities to the point where they were letting me teach their children they can sit in the back of the classroom and grade their papers and I can just take over and start naming kids if they started getting rowdy and if they got a little too rowdy then yeah they could come in and step in because again I'm not their main teacher so I'm not going to handle the discipline for that that should be their head teacher of course but overall like I was a trusted member and faculty member of the school but every so often I'd be treated like a guest and not like a co-worker and and it felt like they just, it would like come out of like random places like just like like you know I've done this 20,000 times I've been here for x amount of years I know the procedure why are you treating me like I don't know what I'm doing <laughs> kind of a thing and I would I would go home crying like it, it would it'd be a mess but then you shake it I had to shake it off just shake it off and then just go back to the next day and just keep going and then maybe have an extra cookie later. <laughs> when you were over at Japan, what did you miss most about home? Um, I miss my mom. Like, despite us having that rift that happened, like, the year I came home from my first study abroad to, like, before leaving for the seven-year stint, I did miss my mom a lot. I, like, my first Christmas in Japan, I cried. I, I called my mom because I was still calling my mom and checking in and she had um, the boys to men Christmas album playing in the background and I was I started bawling because I just missed being home for the holidays and it was really hard not being home um, it, it, was, it was really the holidays that made me miss home a lot but I only went home once when I was living in Japan, so I guess I didn't miss it that much. I, I missed the people. I missed you guys a lot. I wanted you guys to come to Japan and see how amazing it was. I wish I could have just, I could have just brought you guys with me, but I didn't miss being home. So yeah, I, I missed the people at home, but I didn't miss being home. I didn't even really miss the food that much with the exception of like funnel cake and like fried Oreos. <laughs> You know, things that aren't good for you. Um, so, like, certain foods. But overall, it was really my com my community, my social network that I missed. If you could do it all over again, would you? And would you change anything about it? Oh, my God, absolutely. I would do it again in a heartbeat. The only thing I would change differently would be um, learning about... I learned about a program called the World Organization of Organic Farming, WOLF. And it's a program where you pay a membership fee and you can ask farmers in wherever area you want to go to if they need help, if they um, take you on it as an, like a, a temporary apprentice so you can learn their trade, learn more of the culture, um, learn more about the area and whatnot. So it's not like a working program. It's a, it's literally like a cultural exchange slash services exchange program because you're not getting paid. You might get room and board and some food. Well, no, you will get room and board and food, but you're not getting paid any money, um, especially because you're paying money to join the organization. 
and my last month and change in Japan, I finally went to Hokkaido to live there for a month. I think that's the one thing I would change. I'd, I'd like beg for them to take, let me go to Hokkaido. Um, and I was on a horse, an Arabian horse farm for like a month. And I learned from this family of like, this old man and this old woman. They were, they were so funny. They were so sweet. I learned how they did their horse ranching. They had 43 horses on like, I think it was like just under 500 acres of land. I didn't know you could just have 500 acres of land at all as just like some ranchers. And I was like, holy crap. And they ran an endurance racing um, ranch. They trained a handful of their horses, the handful of their herd for the competition. Some, they had some veterans and some champions in their herd too. Um, they did have a breeding program that I didn't, I wasn't a part of. I didn't get a chance to see because they weren't looking to breed any more horses because they already had, um, 43 of them. They already had 43 of them, but they already had like the horses that they had previously bred. Like their, their babies were already a year old. So they weren't, they were like, no, we're going to wait a while. Um, so, but I was there for a month. They were a, a like they were a homestead family. They lived off the land as much as they could. And they were with a community of farmers. So farmers would come and exchange their produce for their manure or exchange their whatever for riding lessons or whatever or, um, you know, stuff like that. And I really loved it. I wish I learned about them sooner. I only learned about them that year, the year that I was scheduled to leave. And I wish I learned about them sooner because I would have been there every flipping year every vacation every long-term vacation i would have been there because man but pretty much the life that they had like set for themselves with their ranch i don't want 500 acres if i got 500 acres that'd be great but i wanted to do i want to do something similar i now want a homestead um where part of the land can be used as an endurance riding or just a trail riding course for people that have horses but that they don't have anywhere to ride and they can stay in the little house and bring their horse or rent a horse I don't I don't know about the renting the horses part I love my animals I don't know if <laughs> I could stomach having somebody just take my animals off and just go right off in the woods or something but but we were always with people when they did that unless they were like um leasing the animal or they owned the animal but they just kept them there um yeah, that's the one thing I would have done differently. Also, mounted archery. I learned how to um, do mounted archery in Japan because I was doing archery at that point and I loved horse riding. Um, when the pandemic started, that was the one activity that I found was open to accepting people despite what was going on because it was outdoors. Generally, the trainer, you're away from the trainer because he's, they got to give you instruction while you're going around either in the ring but then I found a mountain archery place that um, was really open. They were open to foreigners as long as you could speak Japanese, which thankfully, yay, I could. And I loved that experience. That was one of my favorite, favorite memories. And I wish I got into it sooner. Nobody told me about it until like, again, <laughs> the year before I left. I was like, why? That's the one thing I would have done. That and woofing, I would have done those much sooner. Why don't you think more people take this kind of path in life? Um, they're scared of getting out of their comfort zone. Because it, it's, I talk about it like so casually, but no, it's a really big step. You are, you will change as a person. Everything that you thought of as right or everything you thought of as wrong will be changed. Um you will not come back the same person even if you only went for like I went for just six months and I knew I was different seven years I don't even know who that person I don't even know who that Kenya is anymore I don't even know what her ideals were I don't know her dislike I don't know who that person is anymore because it, it was it was a very transformative adventure and I wish more people would believe in themselves as corny as that sounds I really wish they would give themselves that chance and be willing to accept that change 
because it's not for the, you're not changing for the worse. You are changing for the better, but it is very eye-opening, and you may get mad at the things you see when you come back. Um, one of my friends posted something that really, that really resonated with me, and it's that if when you live in a foreign country or where you, if you just live in a culture completely different from your own for a while, when you come back to your hometown, you may be the thing that has changed a lot, but it's going to look like your hometown hasn't changed any like a bit at all and I did have that feeling when I came back like other than like the lack of like community events but again we were coming out of COVID so that was understandable but it felt like nothing had changed when I came back and I was a little bitter by that I'm like what do you mean I went through all this stuff and I learned a b and c and this is the amazing thing I want to share with everybody but everybody was kind of like oh that's nice and that was it. <laughs> Nobody wanted to like explore the change with me or explore other options. So it was kind of, it was a frustrating year of being back. But now I'm finally coming to terms of like, you know what, that's okay. What would you tell young people that are scared to take, scared to chase their dreams? You're going to regret it if you don't. You're going to regret it. You're going to wonder like, you're going to do the thing, and you're going to hate it. You're going to be that person who's going to be like, you know, when I was younger, I had a chance to, to, to go study in Mexico for a year, but I didn't want to because, you know, I figured, like, I had the Mexican culture in my hometown. I could pursue it any time I want. And then you didn't. Uh, when you could have had, like, a full, also authentic experience going or, like, you, you just you need to have faith in yourself like if you're strong enough to ask a person out you're strong enough to ask like a store attendant where something is you're you're strong enough to put yourself in an uncomfortable situation and understand that you will come out of it fine because of the effort you put in like so be if don't be afraid to make mistakes because you're going to have the best adventures and the best conversations from those mistakes. And they'll be hilarious down the line. Please. Especially my, my little student. Me being like tall butt sensei. <laughs> Do you have any advice for young women in the world today who don't know what kind of path they want to take in life? That's okay. Fumble around. Figure it out. Make the mistakes but make sure you're making the mistakes that you know you will come out safe in the end. Like, there's a mistake, like, like, make the mistakes that you know you will grow from, grow from. Don't make the mistakes that could possibly end a chance at doing something or having to wait to do something because you did not have any forethought or you were not thinking of the consequences. Um... And don't be afraid to speak up. Like, be, you have to be assertive. We unfortunately live in a society where women aren't listened to very often. Um, or we're very patronized. Or we're listened to, but what we, are, what we say is not acted on. So, be af don't be afraid to get loud if you need to. Um... Don't be afraid to become the warrior woman if you need to. But, so, yeah. Do you feel like you've been blessed with your life so far? Absolutely. Like, sure, there's, like, things I could say, like, wow, I wish I had more money. But I can easily, I can also turn that around and say, like, wow, I'm, wish, I'm very thankful that we had enough. So that way I could experience what I did. And I really hope that I could... I can give that experience back somehow. You mentioned your mom was very strong and is very strong in her religion of Christianity. Are you more religious or spiritual or a little bit of both? I think I'm more of a little bit of both now. Like, um, when I was younger, I was heavily Christian. Like, I wanted to learn everything that I could. But I think that came more from wanting to make sure my parents knew like that I wanted my parents approval and that I was still doing well again that goody two-shoes thing I just wanted to I was following the rules kind of a thing more than just seeking knowledge about the religion that I was in um 
now that I'm older and doing my own research and whatnot, I'm, I'm, I guess I would lean, I don't want to say I lean to a more spirituality, because I, I, I am Christian, um, I am, I can very self-shortly say that, but I'm a Christian who likes to question things, and who wants to learn more about things that are not Christian, <laughs> and just human nature, and human psychology, and all that kind of a stuff. Do you believe in karma in this life? If you do good, good things will come back to you? To an extent, yeah. I, I just believe in general, if you are good, like the energy you pour in is the energy you're going to get back. Like, I could be yelling at you right now, and then that energy is going to translate into regression from you. So, yeah, that's like just, you know, reciprocity there. But, um, like, say, like, you helped that little kid get his ball out of a tree or something, or you helped the old lady cross the road, and you're probably not going to get the biggest reward aside from a thank you. And that kid may not even say thank you. And they might peg you with the ball in the face. <laughs> but hey, at least you helped. Um, like, at least you, you did put some good into the world. Which is nice. Is there anything in this world that you feel like people are missing? Mm. People don't have enough of? Passion, compassion, love. Being able to see what their neighbor is going through. Yeah... Like, yeah, those, but also just the thirst for knowledge. I really want people to question and research. Like, and you don't gotta be, a, you don't have to be a scholar. I'm not telling you to become a professor. But just, like, say, uh, you're Christian, but do you know why you're Christian? Do you know what Christianity is? Like, who is Jesus Christ? Like, what in the world did he do? Kind of a thing. Like, don't be afraid to question why and what you do. Um, and just, in general, just, just seek knowledge. Like, I love learning. I hate tests, but I love learning new things. I love getting my hands dirty and learning a new skill. Am I going to use it ever again in my life? I don't know. But at least I, I learned something from it and I had a good time. Have you ever considered traveling back to Japan and teaching again, or maybe traveling to Korea? I absolutely want to teach in Korea for at least a year. I do want to travel back to Japan to to visit. I miss my friends. I miss. I just want to see how things are going. But if I was, if an opportunity to teach again was brought up, and the pay was all right, I'd probably do it again. Probably not as long as seven years. Not that. Definitely not. But. I would do it again, yeah. Do you see yourself and do you want to have a family one day? I don't know because childbirth sounds terrifying. <laughs> but I have a little niece. I love her to death. She is so freaking cute. Um, every so often, like, I just look at her and I'm just like, man, what would a little me look like? What would, like, a little me and what would a little, my little, what, my, a little me and my partner, like, what, what would that, what would that look like? And I get kind of, like, nostalgia, nostalgic for a baby that, like, I don't even have, or, like, I'm not even, I don't know, I don't know what, how to describe the feeling. Broody, I guess, is one way to describe it. Um, the idea of, like, raising a little human being to see, like, the cure, like, just having, like, raising them to have curiosity about the world around them. And to try to be kind to the world and others around them. Like, the idea of being able to do that is very striking to me. So, who knows? I don't know. Leads into the next question, though. If you did have a kid, what kind of environment or atmosphere would you want to place around? Again, I want a homestead. So bad. Um, I want them to learn how to live off the land. And they may even... They might choose to never do that again in their life. But teaching them self-reliance but also community where you know like you're yes we are out here but we do this together kind of a thing i want them to learn kindness for their fellow human beings and especially for animals i firmly believe that animals on this planet here have their purpose and the animals that we as human beings domesticated we are their guardians we bioengineered them through breeding through whatever to be here and have a purpose so it is our responsibility it's our like our duty at that point to take care of them and make sure they are good 
Um, if we get chickens, they're not going to survive out in the wild like that, unless they're like a guinea fowl or something. Like, they, they need humans to help them out with that. Or, like, cows. Cows need humans so bad that, like, you leave a cow for, like, by themselves for, like, a month or two. Like, they, they ain't going to be in great hands because we just engineered them to the point that they need us. Um, so, like, just, if I have a kid, they need to learn that it, their duty on this planet is to do good and to take care of this planet, the things on this planet. Be kind to people, but don't try to force their ideals or anything on people and animals. Do you have faith and hope that this world is becoming a better place day by day? Mm, no, <laughs> I don't. Um, sure, there's like stories that I see where like people have done nice and kind things, but overall, I, I don't know, I, I have a bleak sense of like things. I just have a bleak, bleak outlook, really. And I, I want it to go away. I would like to be proven wrong, but just... I think it's mostly just because of social media. You see more bad than good. So who knows? For all I know, the world could be on an, you know, an uptick of like better things coming. But I don't know. I don't get that feeling. I don't think so. Do you feel like we live in a world of corruption? Oh yeah, we certainly do. Politics, um, economics, all that. No, we just all got. We all just got to go back to being farmers. <laughs> What would you say is the biggest issue with the world today? Greed. Like people, even in my own family, I kind of see it a little bit with the younger generation. They want money. They want things. They want clout. But instead of really working hard and like putting their like face to the grindstone to just work little by little for it, they kind of want it quick, fast, and in a hurry. And they want to avoid the struggle, where it's the struggle where you're going to get... The struggle is really the experience you need in order to get to where you want to go. So, yeah. People falling for greed all around us, right? Yeah. And I, I kind of, yeah. Greed, for sure. What would be your last message to give out to others listening right now? Um, if you're thinking about just... If you're thinking about the what ifs and what if I coulds, give it a shot. Just do it. You you never know what could happen at the end. And maybe you'll completely crash and burn at the end of like the journey, but at least you did take that step and you hopefully can reflect as to why you crashed and burned um, and not really blamed anybody except maybe some choices you made. But um, give yourself a chance. To mess up give yourself a chance to just succeed um and just be a little kinder yeah i know that's such a corny thing to say but like really just be be kinder like that can go a long way that can really make someone's day go a long way you make your day go a long way thank you so much for doing this podcast with me kenya it's been a pleasure and an honor you don't know how much you've influenced me through the years. Oh, oh, really? Oh my gosh! Yeah, Matt, 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 and Jake, Jake. Man, you, I can't, I still can't believe how big you guys have gotten. I look like it's so weird. Like, I left seven years ago. Y'all were not this big. Y'all were still freaking kids. Like, and then coming back, I wanted to cry. I was like, oh my gosh, they are young men now. I can't even.